Well, good morning. It is great to see each and every one of you this morning. Thank you so much for joining us and being with us today. And if you are joining us online this morning, it is great to have you with us that way as well. In fact, I just want to say something to uh, all our friends who are joining us online today. I just want to thank you for your faithfulness and your commitment to be with us every Sunday morning. I know that it could be really easy for you to just kind of take this time off. You know, like maybe you sleep in or you get ready for football or you eat a late breakfast or maybe you're doing all those things while you've been watching this morning. Maybe, maybe you couldn't sing just now because you were eating your scrambled eggs and your bacon and your pancakes. Oh, that sounds so good right now, doesn't it? But uh, thank you so much for uh, just worshiping and celebrating Jesus with us every Sunday and joining us in that way. So we really uh, appreciate it very much. Well, if you have your Bible, would you grab it and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and if you're watching online, you might need to wipe the syrup off of your hands, those pages in your Bible are really thin, don't want to rip them or anything like that, I need to stop talking about food now, so. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that's where we want to go together today, we are continuing this short series that we kicked off last Sunday morning that we're calling I'm In, and what we're doing in this series is we're just talking about the kind of church that God wants us to be and how all of us can be in on what he's doing here at RCC. Now, our vision here is to be a loving and authentic Christ-centered family, bringing hope, freedom, and purpose to our local and global community. This is our vision. This is who we believe God is, is calling us to be. And so last Sunday, we kicked off this series by talking about how Jesus invites us to be a part of the family, that he invites everyone into the family, that he invites everyone to be a part of this Christ-centered family. Right, And so we talked about how you know, uh, Jesus invites everyone that no one needs to be left out. No one needs to be rejected. Jesus invites those that others reject. If you look throughout his life and ministry, that's what you see Jesus doing. He invited the people that others rejected. And so we kind of talked about all that, right? And so we all belong. This is home. And so we all belong here because Jesus says that we belong here. And so we kind of worked through all that together last Sunday morning. And what I want to do today is I just want to take some time and I want to talk about how after we're invited into this family, after we're invited into this Christ-centered family, that we're all invaluable. And so I want us to go to 1 Corinthians 12 to kind of help us understand this this morning, that we're all invaluable. Now, I want to make sure you understand that when I say that we're all invaluable, I don't mean that like we're all you know, not important, that we're all worthless, that we don't have any worth. And I, I don't say that because that's not what the Bible says. I mean, the Bible says actually quite the opposite. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that you are uniquely valuable to God. The Bible says that he has some very important and purposeful things in store for us to do. I mean, this is what we believe here at RCC. And we believe this so much that it's one of our core values. We, we have four core values here at RCC, just four. We don't have nine, we don't have 15, we don't have 27 or anything like that. We have four core values and one of those values is the value of passionate purpose. We believe that God gives each and every one of us a passionate purpose, that God gives each and every one of us a mission that we are to boldly live out. I mean, our relationship with God should push us to discover what it is that we can do for God. And so all of us have this God-given mission. We have this passionate purpose that we're to live out. And so I want us to go to 1 Corinthians 12 today because... Paul's going to help us understand some things that I think we need to do in order for us to live out this mission, in order for us to live out this passionate purpose uh, that he gives to each and every one of us, all right? And so there's going to be some notes on the screen behind me. I'd love for you to jot those down if you have a pad of paper and a pen. If you have the RCC app on your device, there's an outline in there where you can fill in some blanks and uh, you can follow along with me this morning, all right? So let's just kind of talk about some things that we need to do to make sure that we live out this God-given mission that he has for each and every one of us. First of all, I think Paul says that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. I think it's the first thing that we find in our text here in 1 Corinthians 12, that we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us if we're going to live out this mission that he has for us. Now, I have you in 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to start at verse 12, all right? So let's just see what Paul has to say here. Let's kind of dig into this. Look what Paul says. He says, just as a body, though one, has many parts... But all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. So understand here that Paul is talking about us. 
All right, Paul's talking about us making up the church. In fact, Paul says that us together with Christ, that we make up the church. And so what Paul points out, to, uh, points out to us here is that as we make up the church, all of us who are followers of Jesus, we've been given the same gift. And so I think this is the first thing that we need to acknowledge, that as we follow Jesus, all of us have this common gift of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's what Paul says. He says that we've been baptized by this one spirit and we've been given this one spirit to drink. All right. So as followers of Jesus, we all have the same gift of the Holy Spirit. And so as a result, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching to a crowd that's gathered together there. And when he's done with this message, the crowd basically starts asking him, like, what is it that we need to do to make sure that we're saved? And I want you to look at Peter's reply. Here's what he says. He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is this first gift that we need to acknowledge as Jesus followers. And so understand this, friends. We're all invaluable in this body because we all have this one common gift. When we surrendered our hearts and lives to Christ and we allowed him to become the Lord and Savior of our lives, we received this gift of the Holy Spirit. And now he and and now as a result, we are invaluable because we have his presence. I mean, that's what the Holy Spirit is, right? It's God's very presence. And so now we're invaluable because we have his presence in us. I mean, remember last week we talked about how Jesus invites everyone. That no one is rejected, no one has to be left out. And he invites everyone because he died for everyone. I mean, understand this, friends. The ground is level at the foot of the cross, right? And so it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. I mean, this is who Jesus is. He invites everyone because Jesus died for everyone. And so now, because he invites everyone, we have this same spirit. I mean, that's what Paul tells us. He says that we're baptized by one spirit so that we can become this one body. And then he says this happens whether we're Jews or Gentiles, whether we're slave, slaves or whether we're free, whether we're prostitutes or businessmen, right? A prostitute was kind of the main character of our teaching last week whether we're homeless or living in a mansion whether we're republican or democrat whether we're male or female whether we're black and white whether we are married or single whether we are rich or poor whether we are sick or healthy whether we are cubs or cardinals right We've all been given the same gift of the Holy Spirit, and as a result, we become this one body. And now, through this invitation by Jesus, we, we, we have this Holy Spirit, and so he must lead us. He, the Holy Spirit, now must lead us. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 14. He said, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. You know, I get up on Sunday mornings, I get up around 5, 30, 6 o'clock. And one of the things that I do consistently every Sunday before, uh, between the time that I get up out of bed and before I'm with you here on the platform is I just spend some time praying. I pray for you. But one of the things that I pray for almost every Sunday morning is that while I am involved in this teaching time with you, I pray that I would rely on the Holy Spirit rather than a sermon. I pray that I wouldn't rely on just words on a page because here's the thing. If I just rely on these words that are on this page, then when it's all over, we're all going to forget, including myself, we're all going to forget what I've said. But Jesus says that with the Holy Spirit, that he will teach us all things and that he'll remind us of everything that he has said. And so, friends, we're going to be a church who walks according to the Spirit. We're going to be a church who walks in the truth. And if we're going to be a church who walks according to the Spirit, and if we're going to be a church who walks according to the truth, then we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because here's the thing. I mean, understand this, friends, all right? When we walk in sin, it's never anybody else's fault but ours. The Holy Spirit will never lead us to walk in sin. In fact, I want you to look at what uh, Jesus says there in John, just a couple of chapters later. Now, John uh, chapter 16, look at what Jesus says. He says, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And so that's part of what the Holy Spirit does. He guides us into all the truth. So he will never guide us to walk in sin. He always guides us in the truth. And so we need to follow him in Romans chapter eight. Look what Paul says. He says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life 
has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so, friends, this is where living out this God-given mission begins. It begins by following the Holy Spirit. It begins by allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us. It begins by allowing this Spirit to lead us, the Spirit who leads us into all truth. It begins by allowing this Spirit to lead us, the Spirit who gives us life, Paul says. It begins by allowing the Spirit to lead us, the Spirit who sets us free from sin and death. And so if we want to live out this God-given mission that we have, then we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. We need to follow Him. Well, secondly, if we're going to live out our God-given mission, we need to allow Jesus to unite us. So we need to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, then we need to allow Jesus to uh, unite us. Now, what do I mean by that when I say that we need to allow Jesus to unite us? What does that mean? If, if you look up the word unite in the dictionary, it draws this picture that Jesus, when he unites us, he like brings us together like as this single group, as this single unit. And in a way, that's what Jesus does when he unites us. But with Jesus, it always goes much deeper than that. Because when Jesus unites us, he brings us together, he brings our hearts together together. And now when our hearts come together, when Jesus unites us, when we come together in the name of Christ, it's not just that we become this single unit or this single group, but now we have a single focus. We have a single goal. We have a single purpose. That's what it means for Jesus to unite us, for us to, to come together in his name. And, and so here's the thing. I look around the room right now and I can see all of you. And God has a lot of creativity. I mean, we're all created in his image, right? But we're all different. Trust me, y'all are different. But you know what? In the church, being different is actually a strength. It's not a weakness. The fact that we're not all the same is actually a strength, and it's not a weakness. And Paul is going to use this picture of the human body to help us understand this. So let's go back to the text. I want us to work through this. We're going to start back at verse 12 again, and then we're going to go on. Look at what Paul says. He says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now let's go on, verse 14. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Now, I want you to look at this. Okay, Remember, we're talking about being invaluable here. Look at what Paul says. He says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Now, understand, I want to stop here for a second because I want to make sure we understand this. Paul's talking about our human bodies, but he's also talking about us. For those of you watching online, he's talking about you. And I want you to hear what, what Paul says here, all right? He says it's God. It's God. It's not your parents. It's not your friends. It's not your neighbors who have brought you here. It is God. God has brought you here to be a part of this Christ-centered family. He has brought you here to be right here, right now. And so don't tell me that you're not important. Don't tell me that you're worthless. I mean, he has put this body together. He's put this family together exactly the way that he wants it. Now, look, look at this. Paul goes on. He says, if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. Now jump down to verse 27. I want you to look at what Paul says here. After all this talk about the human body, look at what he says. He says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. We, friends, we are the body of Christ. Now I've heard it illustrated this way, so I want to share this with you. All right? I've got some pictures that are going to be up here on the big screen. And I want to just see how well we can identify these pictures. So that is an, oh come on, I need a little audience participation here. That is a Ann, I should say Ann, a Ann. That is an elephant. Anybody know what a group of elephants is called? A herd. Very good. I'm starting off with the easy ones. Now that is a And a group of lions is called a pride. Okay, very good. Now, I'm going to maybe challenge you here just a little bit. I mean, you might have to check out your zoology or biology or whatever it is, but this is a cheetah. cheetah. All right, very good. 
Now, anybody know what a group of cheetahs is called? And before anybody says it, it's not Cheetos. Okay? But anybody know what a group of cheetahs is called? I'm getting, making it a little harder now. Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> Anyone? A coalition. A group of cheetahs is called a coalition of cheetahs. Now, here's the last one, all right? And then we're going to move on, I promise. That is a crow. Anybody know what a group of crows is called? A murder of crows, right. That sounds a little scary to me, okay? Now, follow me here. Each one of these animals individually is identified one way. You put a group of them together, and they have a new identity. Now, what do you suppose we call someone who has allowed Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of their life? Maybe a Christian or maybe a believer or a follower. That's a word that I use a lot, a follower or a disciple. What do you call a group of Christians, though, who get together to change the world? What do you call a group of Christians, in our case, who get together to share hope and freedom and purpose with our local and global community? You call them the church. You call them the body of Christ. Now, I want you to look at what Paul says about Jesus here in Colossians 1. Talking about Jesus, he says, he is the head of the body, the church. And so you see, friends, we take on a new identity when we come together under the lordship of Christ, when he unites us. Individually, we're all different, but when we come together in Jesus, we become the body of Christ. We are the church, and the Bible says that it's good when we live together in the name of Jesus. It's good when we live together in unity. Look at what David said in the Old Testament. He said, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And so, friends, we're all different just like each part of the human body that Paul was talking about, all those parts are different. I mean, think about it this way. Let, let's, let's work with this correlation of the human body here, okay? In this body, some of us are the eyes. Maybe some of us are the ears. Maybe some of us are the nose or we're the arms or the hands or the legs or the feet. Some of us are the mouth, and I'm not judging anyone by saying that. I'm not looking at anyone in particular, okay? But we're all different, and yet... We all come together to make up the body of Christ. We all come together to make up this Christ-centered family. And so we may all be different, but we are invaluable. We're invaluable because Jesus unites us. I mean, friends, understand this. We all have different gifts, and we have different skills, and we have different passions, and we have different talents. And yet, when we all come together under the name of Jesus, watch out. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the hope of the world. The Bible says that we are the pillar of truth. And so all of us are invaluable. We are all extremely important and we are precious in this Christ-centered family. And so we come together in the name of Jesus when we become this Christ-centered family. And so let's allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and let's allow Jesus to unite us. And then if we're going to live out our God-given mission, let's allow God to use us. This is the last thing that I want to talk about this morning. We need to allow God to use us. Because here's the thing that I want to make sure we understand, okay? Because we have this passionate purpose, because we have this God-given mission that we are to boldly live out, what that means is that God wants to use us, right? I mean, let me ask you a question. Does God really need to use us? No. I mean, really, if we're going to be honest, the bottom line is no. He's God. He's all-powerful. He can do whatever he wants. He can accomplish whatever he wants, however it is that he wants to accomplish it, right? So really the bottom line, if we're gut level honest with one another, is no, he doesn't really need us. But what happens is he chooses us. He chooses to use us. And because he chooses to use us, we're invaluable. I mean, when he chooses to use us, now we get the blessing of knowing what it's like to serve others. When he chooses to, you, uh, to uh, use us, we get the blessing of knowing what it's like, like to be able to bless others. And because he, the God of the universe, because he chooses us, we are all extremely important. This is what Paul tells us here in our text. Go to verse 21. I want you to look at what Paul says. He says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. I want you to remember that word. We're going to come back to that word here in just a second, all right? 
On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together. So he's still talking about the human body. He's still talking about us, right? There's this correlation. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Look at verse 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So here's a revelation. I'm going to tell you something really important. Okay, you ready? We need each other. We need each other. I mean, you may be sitting here And you may feel like you can make it through life all on your own, but listen to me, you cannot be the church, right, like we are here right now, by yourself. And so we need each other. We need to be a part of this Christ-centered family. And and so uh, all of us are invaluable. I mean, understand this, friends. The body here is not complete without you. The Christ-centered family here is not whole without you each and every one of us in this family we are needed there's not one of us who's not important i mean think about what paul says here he says the parts of the body that seem to be the weakest are the ones that are remember that word i told you hold on to indispensable now you look up that word and what you discover is that it draws this picture that the parts of the body that we would think are the weakest are essential that's a word that's been thrown around a lot this last year isn't it The parts of the body that may seem to us in our eyes to be the weakest are the parts that are absolutely necessary. So what does that mean? It means that many of you perhaps are a part of this body, you're a part of this family, and the things that you do aren't visible to everyone else. Like there's there's a lot of you who are going to do a lot of stuff, but you're never going to be up in front of people like you're never going to lead a small group of people. Or you're you're never going to make it to the platform to sing a song or play an instrument or to share like in a devotional thought or to share in this teaching time. And if we're not careful, it's easy to think that visibility equals importance. And yet, what does Paul say? He would say the parts of the body that are not visible are essential. The parts of the body that aren't visible are absolutely necessary. And so there's not one of you here who is not important. There's not one of you here who is not essential and absolutely necessary. You are essential and you are absolutely necessary because you are being used by God. Look at what Isaiah says in the Old Testament. He says, you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So uh, can we leave that up on the screen for just a second? Let, let's just kind of let that sink in for a moment, can we? I mean, think about this, all right? You are the work of his hand. You are the work of the creator of the universe. So you are essential, you are absolutely necessary, and don't let anyone else tell you any differently. I want you to do me a favor, if you would, for just a second. I want you to just, uh, uh, and for those of you watching at home, I want you to do this too, okay? But I want you just to kind of stretch your hand out in front of me, just kind of take a look at your hand, and I want you to leave it there, okay? Now, the 8 o'clock service, that's all I'm going to say. So I need audience participation with this, all right? So just kind of hold your, hold your hand out and just kind of take a look at your hand. So you've got these five fingers, and all five of these fingers look a little different, and all five of these fingers kind of, you know, do different things. Like you've got the thumb, and the thumb just, you know, in and of itself, it looks really different. And now you might be tempted to say, well, you, my first finger and my third finger are kind of the same, but you point with your, with your first finger, so everybody point. It's, it's okay. I know you've probably been taught not to point, but everybody point at me. Point at me with your first finger. Okay, now try to point with your third finger and be careful here, right? 
but point to me with your third finger. Not very comfortable, okay? But yet the third finger is the one that gets all of the attention because it gets all the jewelry, right? And so you've got your third finger, then you've got your middle finger. Don't point with that one, okay? In fact, we're, not, we're just not going to talk about the middle finger, all right? But then you've got your pinky. Now, do me another favor. Just kind of hold your pinky out like this in front of you. I know some of you right now are like, this is so dumb, all right? Just humor me, people, okay? So just kind of hold your pinky out here. Now, look at your pinky nail for just a second. My pinky nail is probably one of the smallest parts of my body. But I remember when I was... Uh, I didn't tell you to put your pinky down yet. <laughs> you can put your pinky down. But I remember when uh, I was probably about eight or nine years old, I was in the backyard and I was, I was leaning uh, off of the, uh, the back uh, screen door. You know, I like had all my weight on it. And all of a sudden that door gave and it like flung open. And when it flung open, it, it caused me to lose the grip of the door and I started to fall backwards. And so I was going to hit like the concrete step back there. And so just out of instinct, I threw my hands behind my back to catch myself. And when I did that, my pinky nail caught the, um, the sharp edge of the, the upper rim of the metal uh, garbage can that was there. And on the way down, it ripped my pinky nail right off. Yeah. How many of you think that hurt? The smallest part of my body. Now, I also read on the internet this past week, which means it's true because everything on the internet is true. But if you lose your pinky, like if you cut your pinky off, did you know that you lose 50%, 50%, you lose 50% of your hand strength if you lose your pinky? 50, I mean, it's just, it's my, it's my pinky. But if I lose it, 50% of my hand strength is is right here in my pinky. So here's, here's what I want you to know, okay? The smallest part of my body gets ripped off and it hurts. I lose the smallest part of my body and I'm not as strong. You may think as you sit here that you're just a small part of this body, but you are invaluable. Because if you get ripped out of here, it hurts. Without you, the body isn't as strong here. And so, I want, I want you to hear me on this, all right? Don't ever say, eh, I just, uh, I just write some thank you cards. Don't ever say, you know, all I do is, uh, all I do is just, Make some food for people who need a meal. Don't ever say, I just, I don't know, I, I just, all I do is wash some dishes after a funeral dinner. Don't ever say, I just, I just set up some tables and chairs and I don't know, I kind of decorate them and just kind of make them, make them, I try to make them look nice. Don't ever say, you know, all I do is just wipe down some doorknobs in between the services. Don't ever say, I just, I don't know, I just give gift cards to the new pastors at our church. Don't ever say, I, I just give a ride to somebody who can't drive so they can go to church on Sunday morning. Don't ever say, all I do is decorate the women's restrooms, help residents in a nursing home give some kids who have incarcerated parents some Christmas gifts. Friends, it all matters. You matter. Your gifts matter. Your passions matter. Your talents matter. Your skills matter. Your story matters. It all matters. You are invaluable. You, you matter in the Christ-centered family here. In fact, I want to I wanna end our time by just making sure that all of us understand how much we really matter. I mean, you may be sitting here this morning, and you may be thinking to yourself, I don't think anyone notices me. I don't think anyone loves me. 
I don't know that anyone cares about me. I don't know that I'm really all that significant. I don't don't feel like I have anything significant that comes from my life. Those are just lies. Those are Satan's lies, that no one loves you, that no one cares about you, that you're not significant, that no one notices you. Those are just the lies of the spiritual enemy because there is a God who is crazy about you. There is a God who is deeply and passionately in love with you. In fact, you know what? Jesus told a parable. He told a parable to help us understand how much he loves us. He tells this parable about the shepherd who has 100 sheep, and one of the sheep runs off. And so in the story, Jesus says that the shepherd leaves the 99 to go and get the one. That's how much he cared for the one sheep. That's how much he loved the one sheep, that he was willing to live to leave the 99 in order to, to get the one. And God has such an outlandish love for you, and God has such a crazy, radical, awesome love for you that if you don't have a relationship with him through Jesus, he's willing to leave all the others to come find you. He's willing to leave all the others to bring you back. You know, I've got, I've shared with you before that I love to fish, so I've got all, some of my fishing tackle up here. And, uh, you know, let's say that, like, I don't know how many lures I have up here, but I have well over 100, okay? So, so let's say that the next time that I'm out on the water and I'm fishing, I lose one of these lures, which tends to happen quite often. I throw it up in a tree or, you know, maybe I get it snagged in a rock under the water or something like that. So, like, like let's say that I'm fishing with this lure right here and I get it snagged and I try to do everything I can to get it loose. And in the process, I, I snap my line, all right? And so I've lost this lure. You know what? I'm not too broken up over it. Because, I mean, I got plenty of others, right? I mean, I'm out a few bucks, but it really doesn't bother me all that much. The parable from Jesus tells us that this is not the way that God treats us. He's so in love with you that he's willing to leave all the others to come find you and to take you back. In fact, his love is so outlandish and his love is so crazy and his love is so radical and his love is so awesome and his love is so passionate that he was willing to send his only son, his one and only son, to die. He sent his one and only son here to die this awful, horrible, torturous criminal's death on a cross. And you know why he did it? He did it because he loves you. And he did it because he cares about you. And he did it because you're you're significant. I want you to see what John, how John records the, the final moments from Jesus as he hangs on the cross. Look at what John says. He says, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So listen to me, friends. When Jesus said, it is finished, that was just the beginning for you. And so if you're sitting here this morning and you think that no one notices you, that no one loves you, that no one cares about you, that you're not significant, then here in just a few moments when when we're dismissed and everybody's walking out, I'm going to be down front. I want you to come and I want you to talk to me because I want you to meet Jesus. Because you are loved, and you are cared for, and you are significant. And so you just make your way here to the front, and we'll spend some time talking this morning. If you're watching us online, my email address should be on the screen, bradferris at rochesterchristian.com. You send me an email, and we'll set up a time where we can talk so that I can introduce you to this man named Jesus who can change your life from the inside out. Friends, we are invaluable. You matter. We all matter in the Christ-centered family here. Let's pray, and then we'll share in a time of communion together. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for caring about us. 
Thank you, Father, that we're significant to you. To the point that you were willing to send your son to give his life, to die for us. We thank you, Father, for the new life that we have in him. And we thank you, Father, that because of Jesus and because you have brought us into this family to be right here, right now. And because we all have this same gift of the Holy Spirit. And because you choose to use us. I thank you, Father, that we are invaluable, that we matter. Regardless of what anyone else might say to us, regardless of what the world might say to us. We matter. And so thank you, Father, for bringing us together as the church. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together as the body of Christ. Thank you for bringing us together as this Christ-centered family. Father, I thank you that you have a passionate purpose for each and every one of us, that you have a mission that we are to boldly live out. So may we allow the Spirit to lead us. May we allow Jesus to unite us. May we just allow you to use us as we live for you. We thank you, Father, for the hope and the freedom and the purpose that can be found in Christ. We pray these things in his name.